Hello and welcome to this review of my RHEC 95, aka the Void Keyboard. This was a donation from user Riskable, a 3D printing savant who designed and hand-built this entire keyboard and the firmware for it. Obviously, a bizarrely huge undertaking, especially as it's all new designs as well. The switches, stabilizers, etc., even the clicker are all entirely novel and not based on existing stuff as far as I'm aware. So this was all done right from the ground up. Apart from the PCB and some small parts like the magnets, screws, stab wires, etc., the entire keyboard is 3D printed, so the case, the switches, the keycaps, the accessories, etc., which not only leaves immense room for customization, as you can just print whatever you want it to look and feel like, but also makes it quite cheap. We've been told the whole keyboard costs less than $100 to put together, not counting labor, of course. Plus, you can just take the top off and wash it if you want, or exchange it for a new top. He gave me two sets of toppers, ones with somewhat traditional semi-transparent keycaps, and one with flat double-shot ones, which are more transparent. I requested he make this keyboard as RGB as he possibly could to fit the neon theme of the trailer I made for it, and I dare say he came through with flying colours, pun intended. More on that later. You can take the tops off very easily, they're held to the bottom case via magnets, although I guess you can do without them as well, just using some 3D printed pegs or something. This is much more elegant though, they snap into place very securely, and it works a treat, and the case halves are pretty much solid 3D printed material. The keyboard weighs a surprising 850 grams in total. Or for my American friends... Obviously, I wouldn't do a drop test or a flex test on this because I don't think that would be very good for the PCB, but the case feels solid enough that I'm not afraid that anything's going to happen to that, really. And best part is, of course, that even if something breaks, you can just print a replacement for pennies. For reference, everything except the clear keycaps are printed out of PETG, the clear caps are PCTG instead, due to that material's higher transparency. The keycaps, especially the flat ones, come off relatively easily if you mistreat them, but I haven't seen them come off during use yet. In any case, these are super smooth and shiny, but in contrast to what I had thought, he didn't polish these, they're smooth like this by default. The other keycaps are a bit rougher because they're not flat, but it's actually a pretty nice texture. It's not double shot like the flat caps are, but that's fine. You can feel the lettering, obviously, and I bet they'll gather finger grime in the legends eventually, but you can easily wash it, so I think that wouldn't be much of a problem. The legends are almost invisible when the backlight is off, but become quite visible when it's on, so I left it on generally. Of course, like I said, if you're not a fan of the lighting, you can just make some double-shot keycaps, although that is a bit more labour-intensive, obviously. Naturally, you can print whatever shape, style, colour and even mount you want. He printed all the normal ones in MX mount, but he also included an Alps mount one as an example. Here's some Space Cadet inspired caps he made for it, they look very nice in my opinion. Plus a bunch of extras as well, such as a radioactive sign, a house, a bomb, <laughs> a keycap with my name on it, etc, etc. There are also some accessories that he's printed, there's holes in the case for mounting this stuff. Again, you can make up what you want here. He included a phone or tablet holder, I think it's supposed to be used like this except plugged in here, an Oreo holder for double stuff ones, naturally, a mouse bungee, which is used for guiding your mouse cord, although I haven't used a corded mouse for at least 10 or so years, some flags, although he apparently thought our flag was blue, white, red rather than the other way around, perhaps he's a farmer sympathizer, and a coaster, which is so elaborate looking that I didn't even recognize it as such. He even included some building blocks to build your own thing with. However, again, it's all 3D printed, so you can make whatever you want. You could print the case in the shape of the Temple of Nod if you wanted, and could bear the ergonomic typing shape that would come of it. That sounds awesome, actually, now that I think about it. Maybe you should make that an option. So, if you want to, you can make your keyboard look like this. <laughs> Reminds me of that comfort ergonomic keyboard. 
So coming back to the lighting real quick, there's surface mount LEDs with incredible luminosity. Now your normal RGB runs off of the 5 volts that comes from the standard USB cable that you plug into it, right? Well for this one, that's not remotely enough, it uses additional power. There's a separate plug that you can use with a phone charger for example. But even that isn't enough to get the full power, you need a power delivery charger and cable, because normal cables and chargers don't provide the 18 watt minimum you need to run this at full beam. Now I got a 20 watt one and even with that I don't seem to be getting the whole enchilada. And remember I'm filming this with very bright studio lights on so it's even brighter than it appears. At the highest setting the light is bright enough that it's pretty blinding, he even included sunglasses for the unboxing. I've been told that at full beam with all white light the keyboard gets to a toasty 42 degrees celsius which means that it doubles as a nice hand warmer. Parts of the keyboard, especially here, heat up even more to about 50 degrees. I haven't been able to get it that hot though, like I said, I think my power delivery stuff is fake or something. By the way, if you take the top off, it's brighter than the sun. He included a bunch of preset lighting modes, but he's changed them a couple of times at my request. At the moment he's still working on a UI that allows you to program it yourself. For now he's just doing it all for me and then sending me the new firmware file. Speaking of which, the way you flush the firmware is absurdly easy. You just press more fun plus B, which opens a window, and then you just drag the file into that, and then it updates itself, and it even closes the window for you. Now, this made me very angry, because all this time I had believed that the ridiculous way programs like QMK did it, so, you know, with external software first of all, and then a bunch of weird menus and buttons and crap that didn't explain itself at all, was necessary. But now I find out that you don't need any of that crap, and you can just do it like this if people make their keyboards properly. I tell you, I was fucking fuming. Why don't all flushable keyboards do it like this, instead of making us fuck around with all these stupid programs that are so non-intuitive and turn out to be completely unnecessary in the first place. Anyway, rant over, you control the preset lighting modes with this rotary encoder at the top, which is also magnet based as it happens. He spent quite a lot of time on that thing alone. I'm not sure what shape this knob is supposed to be, but you can print whatever the hell you want of course. I think I originally asked for one in the shape of a massive cock, but he gave me this one instead. Now during the unboxing I realized I should have asked for an obelisk of light shaped one instead, but hey, maybe that's one for round two. You control the luminosity with this wheel encoder on the side here, hold more fun and then wheel this to increase or decrease the light levels. I guess you can reprogram this and the other encoder as well if you want, but I'm finding this setup quite practical. I'm messing around with the lighting a lot on this model, as that was more or less what I had it explicitly built around after all. I mean, <laughs> I'm not one for backlit boards generally, but if you do go RGB, do it well I'd say. It took some refinements to get the animations to look smooth, and there's still a work in progress, but overall it's a nice looking board colorwise, I'd say. Occasionally the lighting glitches, you just saw it a few seconds ago, and just now as well. It didn't do that originally, but since one of the last firmware updates, it now flickers from time to time. Again, I think it might be because of a power thing, but I'm not sure. I think the camera also makes it look like there's other things wrong with it, but that's an artifact, it's just those occasional flickers. The north position is just a standard rainbow wave, northwest is an explosion mode that also triggers the beeper and the clicker, oh yeah, it has a beeper and a clicker by the way, west is static white, southwest is a color radar mode, he's working on making that look more like an actual radar apparently, south is off, which is useful for when you have to leave it at night as it doesn't power itself down if you shut your computer off, southeast is another wave mode, East just slowly spells my channel name from YouTube, and Northeast shows the animation of some video clip. I think he told me at some point what this was, but I forgot. I originally thought that changing the lighting modes was what the remote control, yes, the keyboard has a remote control, because of course it does, was for, but at the moment it just outputs numbers. I wouldn't be surprised if he does that in the future though. Again, you can in principle program what you want with it, of course. Now we come to what's perhaps the real star of the keyboard, quite a claim considering all the amazing stuff in and on here, the switches. He calls them void switches, which is why I named the board after it. I'm going to be honest, AHEC95, pronounced as RHEC95, isn't that great of a name in my opinion. I like the void keyboard much better. 
I've done a teardown video on these switches before where I show how they work in detail. They're a type of Hall effect switch operated entirely by magnets. There's no spring, neither coil nor leaf in these switches at all, making it even more contactless than other contactless switches, if that makes sense. In fact, even the tactility is generated in a contactless manner, which is a mind-boggling notion just of its own. Just consider the implications of that for a second. A contactlessly tactile, tactile switch. There's three tiny neodymium magnets in each switch, one in the slider, which serves as an actuator as well as an attractor, one in the top of the housing, which is a mediator, and one just below the keycap in a separate holding cup, which is a levitator. It works by alternating between attraction between one pair of magnets and then repulsion between the other. The switch generates a tactile bump by loosening the hold between the attractor and the mediator. When they pull apart, the switch suddenly releases its magnetic grip, which can be felt as a tactile bump. At the same time, it resets because of the repulsion between the levitator and the mediator, and the attraction between the attractor and the mediator. Quite ingenious. Where it goes from ingenious to inspired is the fact that these switches, being 3D printed, are fully tunable. The switch weight, length of throw, and most notably the magnitude of the tactility can all be modulated by printing the switches in different ways or by using different magnets. For example, here's some normal sized switches. These have a standard 4mm throw, but he also gave me this fluorescent one with a 15mm key press, which just feels ridiculous. I mean, just look at this, as well as a few low profile demos he made. The way you tune the tactility, which is probably the most eye-catching feature, is by varying how much plastic there is between the attractor and the mediator in the steady state. The thicker the plastic in between, the less hold they have on each other at rest, and the gentler the tactile bump. He sent me over a switch tester with different distances between the magnets to show the effect on tactility. At 0.0 millimeters, there is no plastic between the magnets at all, and these have almost certainly the most extreme tactile bump of any keyboard switch I've ever tried. Look at it, it's ridiculous. At 2 millimeters, meanwhile, they're only weakly held together to begin with, and the switch is only faintly tactile, it's almost linear. The two plates he printed for me use different strengths. I asked for a 1.6mm gap, which might be surprising to some of you that I asked for something that sounds not too tactile, but it's more tactile than you think, and I also do think there is such a thing as too much tactility. I'd rather have my tactility clean than excessive. The other plate he made for me has 1.3mm, which is a bit stronger, but even the 1.6mm plate took me a while to get used to, so this is perhaps a bit overkill. You can change the strength of the magnets to tune this parameter as well, of course. I mean, just consider this for a second. You can choose your own tactility, per key even, if necessary. This is quite simply a revelation. I ended up really liking this. As I said, it took me some time to get used to this level of tactility, and I think I'd add another 0.1mm if I could, but still, this is already quite excellent, it's very nice to use. Without a buffer spring, the tactile bump is by definition limited to being at the very top of the throw in this design, but it's very clean feeling, and that's the most important thing, I reckon. I mean, I like Alps tactile switches not because they're super tactile, because they're not. I like them because they feel clean and sharp, and not rough and undefined like Cherry does it. These switches are the real deal in terms of tactile feel. They're perhaps the only clean feeling modern tactile switches that I know of that aren't based on rubber domes. And yes, Stuff like Zelios and any other modded MX platform switch is not clean feeling. It's just a variation on an inherently crappy form of tactility, in my opinion. Of course, one foreseeable problem with these switches is smoothness. Although I don't know much about 3D printing, everything I've seen of additive 3D printed plastic like this isn't smooth, it's rough. There's voids and unevennesses, and that's not good for switch parts. See, when a switch is said to be contactless, it's not truly contactless, of course. It just means that there's no friction between the slider and the contacts. In this case, there aren't any contacts to begin with, and there also isn't any friction between the slider and the spring as well, because it doesn't have one of those either, but it still has friction between the slider and the housing. It'd be very hard to make a switch that doesn't have that, because there'd be nothing to give it stability. 
It is possible to print things very nice and smooth, the flat keycaps are a prime example of that. Also in these tall switches you can see that the flat face of the slider is very smooth, but the rest, which is rounded, is not. I guess having a better printer would be useful in this regard as well. However, while the surfaces aren't as smooth as those keycaps, it's not bad. You do however notice a little bit of binding on off-center key presses. It's not huge, in fact I can really only trigger it on free standing keys because I can't press the keys in the main area sideways enough to trigger it, so it is really pretty minimal, but it is there. I think this might become less of an issue with better printing methods, or you could even lubricate them I guess, in a way it's not really a property of the switch itself. On normal key presses, it's not as smooth as some of those modern contactless linears out there, but it is a lot better than I thought. It's of course quite difficult to make tactile switches smooth to begin with, even though this has contactless tactility, which I'm sure helps. In fact, the whole notion that it's tactile to begin with helps with smoothness, as tactility generally causes you to gloss over any unevennesses, and this board is definitely tactile enough that it would be difficult to detect a lack of smoothness even if it were there, I think. This is also why I focus especially on smoothness on linear keyboards, by the way. The stabilizers are also a novel design. They still use a wire like traditional stabs, but include magnets above the wires. There's a couple of reasons for that. Apparently this does slightly help with stability, but also it helps to preserve the tactility in stabilized switches. Typically they lose some of that. Furthermore, it adds a bit of additional weighting, and most of all, it helps a lot with the sound, as it more or less completely eliminates stab rattle. So this is a nice touch actually, and again, it's contactless, so it doesn't impose any additional friction. As I mentioned, it also comes with a clicker. It's enabled by default, although you can disable it by just unplugging it from there. Even this is a novel thing. It's an external clicker, much like you often see done using solenoids, but instead of that, it's actually a relay which you constantly engage between when you press a key. I think it originally toggled between off and on between key presses, so you get one click per key press, but it would have two different key press sounds. Now it toggles between on and off in the same key press, which means it clicks twice per key press, up and down, but the sound is consistent. I must say, I think this is a very ingenious design, and it works well too. Plus, I think it sounds surprisingly satisfying. Just the same, it isn't as well integrated into the keyboard, it's just hanging around like this. The PCB is the one component other than the magnets and a few other minor parts which are not 3D printed, and it's almost certainly the most complicated and most expensive part of the whole keyboard. Thankfully he supplied me with an extra one so I can show you around it. This one comes without any of the components, of which there are a fair few as you can see. Each switch has as many as 7 solder points and even then the board is hot swappable. The holes in the PCB are mounting points for the bottom part of the case, there's only a few through board solder points, and most of them are for the sockets and plugs. Complicated as it is, it is thankfully labelled with what everything is, such as the matter translation array, magneto reluctance capacitor, latter deplaneration oscillators, subatomic encabulator, gonna have one of them, sonic screwdriver, multiversal compass, etc. I'm surprised he didn't label the LEDs blinken lights. The back's got funny shit all over it too, like do not machine wash dry humor only, and a whole list of nutritional facts. He even signed my name on it. I guess when you design something from the ground up, you can go to town like this. As if everything I've said so far wasn't enough, the back of the PCB also reminds one that this is actually an analog keyboard. And yes, it has adjustable actuation. I think he set it to about halfway the travel, which is fine, especially with switches this tactile, but really you could choose at which point it actuates, and that is a really, really nice feature. I've already done a lot of videos about that. It's held to the bottom case, which is two parts by the way, with a bunch of pegs and screws, and although it's not mega secured in there, it's secured enough, I think. It sags a little bit when you pick it up from one end, but considering the only securing backplate is the PCB itself, I guess that's to be expected. That's also why I didn't want to do a drop test. From what I understand, the cost of custom PCBs ramps up pretty quickly after this size, which is the main reason why he went with a compact form factor. Now, thankfully, most of the keys are here, including a delete and a print screen button. I guess he must have noticed from my earlier videos that I use those keys a lot. 
Plus, of course, there's a set of macro keys above the F keys, which you can program stuff into. I think I only asked him for some page up and page down keys, which are otherwise missing from the layout, and those are very useful for things like Tarkov, but that's about it. The layout is pretty complete otherwise anyway. Overall, this is a fantastic keyboard. Just think of how much new ground this thing breaks. It's incredible. I really think that this has the potential to go all the way, even if it's not the copycat crap most people prefer nowadays. Especially considering its legitimacy in the tactile department, this really is something people should keep in mind, I think. And remember, you can choose how tactile you want it, which is just amazing. And if you're not happy, just print some new switches with a different tactility and slot them in. They're hot swappable anyway. It's just so brilliant on so many levels. Anyway, that's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following are two typing demonstrations, one with the clicker on and one with it off. Happy holidays. Mmm. Delicious. Seven out of ten, too many calories.